So the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is uh, briefly go over some, I would like to briefly go over some uh, of the different kinds of chemicals that we might use as tools when we're managing a fishery. Some of these you may be familiar with or you may have used. I want to just go into a little bit of detail about some of these. By no means is this an exhaustive list. The first thing that we want to understand when we're talking about the kind of chemicals that we're going to use is, of course, they're going to be regulated by someone, by the FDA or the EPA or someone. So it's your responsibility to understand what the regulations are if you're going to use a particular chemical. You might be surprised um, that the FDA has jurisdiction on some of these, the Food and Drug Administration. Well, these chemicals are drugs. But uh, a big reason is, is that if you're working in the field, the fish that you expose to the chemical might be released and it might be eaten by a human. And so therefore the FDA has some sort of jurisdiction here, sometimes the EPA, different people um, have different jurisdictions. A lot of the chemicals that you'll mess with have a 21 day withdrawal period, which means if you use it on a fish, that fish must be held in clean water for 21 days to flush their system before you release it into the wild. Consequently, that makes a lot of these chemicals impractical for use in field studies because you simply can't hold the fish for that long. So you have to find an alternative chemical that does not have the 21 day withdrawal period. The withdrawal period and the toxicity of different chemicals are determined by something called a 96 hour LC50. This is not just for fish chemicals, but for all kinds of chemicals. This is how talk, one way that toxicologists determine if a particular chemical is going to be harmful to organisms in the environment. Um, what the LC50 stands for is the lethal concentration 50%. So that's the concentration of the chemical that will kill 50% of the target organism within 96 hours. You always have to have a time limit for this as well. Um, why 50%? Well, it's um, the median, kind. it's near the median, it's where um, there's the least variability. If you looked at, uh, there's going to be, a, sometimes there's going to be a lot of organisms that are very sensitive to the chemical, there's going to be some that are not so sensitive, but if you use the, um, t the concentration that kills half of your target organisms, there's less variability in that than if you use different concentrations. Um, so consequently, a toxicologist basically will have a, a number of tanks set up with different organisms and they'll have serial dilutions of a particular chemical and they'll see what concentration of that chemical kills half the organisms in 96 days. Why 96 days? Well, 96 days, or excuse me, 96 hours. 96 hours is four days. And so with a 96 hour LC50, that means you can come in on Monday, set up your experiment, start it on Tuesday, run it through Friday. So there's no magical biological reason for 96 hours. So what are some of the target organisms? Um, a lot of them are, are common organisms that you should be familiar with. Uh, Daphnia are a very important target organism. Also fathead minnows. Also uh, rainbow trout are used a lot of times and bluegill are also a good target organism. So this is a way of actually testing the chemical on the organisms that, that might be harmed by it to try to determine toxicity. Once toxicity is determined, then the allowable concentration is like 10% of that or something. Talk to an environmental toxicologist to get the, the real details on that. Okay, so let's talk about some of these different chemicals. First, we're gonna talk about pesticides or chemicals that we can use to kill fish. The most common that you're going to work with and you're going to run into is rotenone. It's a botan botanical derivative. I believe it was discovered in South America. Uh, people that live down there had a particular plant. Um, I want to say Daris is the genus or the Daris root or the Daris plant, D-E-R-R-I-S. You have to look that up. At any rate, they would chop it up and put it in the water and to capture fish and uh, isolated the chemical that kills the fish and it's called rotenone. About 500 parts per billion um, will kill most fish 
but different fish have different susceptibilities to it, so only a tenth of that will kill shad, so you can be a little bit selective. Uh, also, if you lose, lo use lower concentrations, you can slow fish down without killing them. If you want to detoxify it, you can use potassium permanganate, and this is a chemical that's used to detoxify a lot of things. Um, I believe that it does a good job of, of oxidizing organic chemicals, and rotenone being a botanical is an organic chemical. So, for example, if you have a stream, you might be dripping rotenone into a spot, and then downstream dripping in potassium permanganate to detoxify it if you want to kill out a stretch or do a, a rote known sample or something. This is not reversible, um, so once they're exposed to it, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think you can't you know, give them a heavy dose and then put them in water and they'll snap out of it. It will also kill zooplankton, insects, crustaceans, uh, so inverts as well as vertebrates, but it's not toxic to humans. Um, Although it's treated as toxic to humans, uh, back in the day, used to do like co-rotenone studies, and they advertise, and people could come out and pick up the fish and clean them and take them home, and eat them. They don't allow that anymore, but the calculations are such that the amount of rotenone that you would have to eat to be toxic to you is more than you could consume, or something. So it's a, it's essentially not toxic to humans. Now, if you do want to apply rotenone, at least here in Illinois you have to be with uh, a DNR biologist. You can't just go buy this and, and go spread it out wherever you want. Okay, another um, pesticide is uh, antimycin. And this is not as common, but it's more effective. It can be very selective, so um, you can fine-tune the concentration for specific species of fish that you want to get rid of. Uh, one way that is, it is um, administered to the lake is adhere to different sand, different sizes of sand grains, which have different sinking rates. And so you can apply it to a certain, with, with a certain size sand grain that it's attached to, and it will sink, and it will only release down at the bottom of the lake, or, or, or you could have it released at the top. So um, you've got a lot more options with antimycin, but it's a lot more expensive. And you can detoxify it the same as you can with rotenone. Um, but given all the advantages of it, it's so expensive that usually rotenone is more often used. Another one that's been investigated that, that has been used is a sodium cyanide. And this is really effective, and it's 100% reversible if the fish is put in, in fresh water quickly enough. But it's cyanide. And so the, um, the reason that it's not, I don't think it's legal anymore, nobody uses it, it's not because it's dangerous to the fish, it's dangerous to the applicator. You don't know what you're doing and you make a mistake and, and you'd be giving yourself a dose of cyanide, which is, of course, very poisonous. So we don't use this anymore. I remember when I was in grad school and I was, I think we were cleaning out an office um, for someone and looking through the drawers of this old lab and there was these huge syringes of, I don't know what it was, but it was an antidote for cyanide that they'd have to carry with them in case they gave themselves an accidental dose. So we don't want to, to do that, so we don't use that anymore. Uh, TFM uh, is an acronym. Um, I don't know what, exactly what it stands for, but this is a lampricide. So this is a very spef specific pesticide that's used to kill the larvae of the sea lampreys in the Great Lakes. So the sea lampreys got into the Great Lakes. They decimated the lake trout and other native species. Uh, of course, the Great Lakes being so huge, you can't sample or fish them out. But to reproduce, they have to um, ascend all the tributaries that flow into it. So that's a nice choke point where you can try and, and poison these fish to control their numbers. And so this TFM gets dripped into these streams where the lampreys spawn and it kills the young uh, larval lampreys as they're heading back toward the Great Lakes. Okay, another type of chemical that you may use would be an anesthetic. So if you're going to do surgery, you might want to knock the fish out. Um, if you're going to haul the fish or handle them and you want to calm them down, you might not knock them out, but you might make them sleepy. 
Uh, this can reduce stress when you're handling them. can make it easier to handle them, of course, if the fish is knocked out. These are also useful for uh, euthanasia. It's considered a humane way to uh, kill a fish if you need to kill a fish for research, just to give them an overdose with you, uh, uh, give them an overdose with anesthetic, and they'll just go to sleep. Very common one is MS-222. It's also called Finquel. It's also called tricane methanol sulfate, uh, sulfonate. This is uh, a widely used anesthetic in fish biology. It is one of these chemicals that has the 21 day withdrawal period. So say you're doing surgery in the field where you're surgically implanting some tags or you're trying to calm the fish down so you can handle them before returning them to the water. Can't do that with it, MS-222. You gotta hold them for, for 21 days. So this is more often used um, for euthanasia or if you're working in a laboratory. It takes about one to two parts per million to knock out the fish and of course less to calm them down. It stops the opercular movement. So if your fish are going to be out, if you're doing surgery or something, you want to uh, perfuse the gills. You want to keep water moving across the gills um, so that you can help to, to get the heart is still beating, so the blood is still pumping, but they're not moving water across the gill, so you need to do that for them. I also think that um, you need to watch the pH. I'm pretty sure that this can cause the pH to drop precipitously if you're in unbuffered water. So you might want to consider using um, sodium bicarbonate or checking the alkalinity of your water before using MS-222. Another anesthetic that's used mostly just in research is quinaldine. Um, so here the gills still work, but the uh, voluntary muscles, the swimming muscles are shut down. I've never used this. I've never seen it, but it's out there. Carbon dioxide can be an effective anesthetic. At this time, it's one of the few, if maybe the only, common anesthetic that has no withdrawal period. And so, for example, when we were doing surgery on our sturgeon, this is what we'd have to use because the fish are going right back into the water. Um, the thing about it is it's a gas, which is difficult to control the dosage. So it's not like something that you can measure out. You have to, to just turn on... Uh, an air stone that's bubbling the gas and then watch the pH and watch the behavior of the fish but different water has different chemistry if you remember from limnology the CO2 is going to react differently of course it's a gas so it's going to bubble out um, so controlling how much you give the fish can be difficult and and you know you have the potential to give them um, an overdose of CO2 if you're not careful so you can use uh, sodium bicarbonate, uh, Alka-Seltzer, uh, that's one way for small fish. Sometimes people will knock out the fish or euthanize the fish. Is to drop in a couple Alka-Seltzer tabs. I usually just have a tank of CO2 laying around, which is what I would use. Of course, this will also will affect the pH. As you know, with CO2, it uh, forms carbonic acid. So there's a lot of things that you have to watch for when you're using carbon dioxide. Having said that, having used it quite a bit, it does work pretty slick. You just kind of watch the fish. When it seems like they're out, you go do your work, put them in fresh water with oxygen. Make sure you bubble oxygen into the fresh water. They seem to recover pretty well. Now, my favorite anesthetic is clove oil. And it's just what it says. It's just oil from cloves. You can buy it at the drugstore. It it's very cheap uh, because it's used for toothaches for humans. And so it it's known to have those properties where it can um, uh, you know, inhibit the nervous system. And consequently, that makes it a very benign chemical. I mean, if you can put it in your mouth on your tooth, then you can feel comfortable working with this. It's not going to harm you at all. And I'm convinced it doesn't harm the fish at all. It does not take very much. Very low doses are effective. Some people will take and dissolve it in alcohol and then dissolve the alcohol clove oil slurry into a five gallon bucket. I just put the clove oil right into a five gallon bucket, swish it with my hands, it's oil, it tends to float on top a little bit, but the stuff that you want that, that, that does the work seems to leach out and you just kind of mix it with your hand and it doesn't seem to take very much at all. It reverses very easily, so once the fish are out, you put them in fresh water, they come right out of it. Um, 
You can easily overdose them, use it for, euth uh, for euthanasia. It's cheap. It makes the boat smell really good. Um, so that's why it's my favorite anesthetic right now. It's currently in legal limbo. Um, technically, there's not really... You're not, it still has a 21-day withdrawal period. You're not technically allowed to use this chemical in fish that are going to be returned to the water. Um, but I do know that there's been a lot of people working on getting the government approval. It's one of those things where pretty much everybody knows. I mean, it's got to be harmless, right, if you can use it for toothaches. Um, but legally, you have to go through certain steps to get it approved. And so the AFS has been working to try to um, uh, pressure the government into allowing this. And I think uh, there, there's some, some people that had a variance where they could use it. And um, it's one of these things where the legality sometimes. So you want to be aware of the legal situation. Having said that, um, it's a very effective chemical and it does a really great job. Uh, I just recently saw a paper that suggested that spearmint oil might also be similar. And again, I think this is an attempt by people to show that these botanically derived chemicals um, can be very harmless and can be very helpful when, excuse me, when working with fisheries. Okay, um, I have a video just showing the effectiveness of the clove oil, some fish that I knock out and then recover. I put that on the YouTube page, so you might want to check that out. Okay, now some other kind of miscellaneous chemicals that you may run into. Good old table salt. We use this all the time. We've already talked about how adding salt to the hauling tank will help when you're transporting fish. Helps to reduce their stress. Another use of uh, salt in fish management is to control yellow or white grub in ponds. So if you're familiar with the life cycle of this yellow or white grub, you see the, the grub it's um, perhaps it's a nematode, um, but if you clean the fish, you'll see this grub in the muscle and in the organs, and it's harmless to humans, especially if you cook, but even if you don't cook, it's not something that can transfer to humans, but of course it's not appealing to see these little grubs in your filet. A lot of people don't want them, and um, so the grub has a life cycle that goes from the fish uh, to the water, which gets into a snail, which then... Oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. No, no, no. goes from the fish to a bird, like a heron, and from the heron to the water to the snail, through the water back to the fish. That's the life cycle. So the snail is an important part to this grub's life cycle. And it turns out that uh, two and a half parts per thousand or so of salt will control the snails, which will then eliminate them and eliminate the grub from a pond. So... Some people um, will to go buy a salt lick, a cow salt block, and throw it in their pond. Uh, it's not not very precise, but uh, I have heard of it working, and so it's something to keep in mind if you have a small pond and, and you want to control these. Now there are a lot of pesticides or herbicides that you would use in the management of fisheries. When we talked about our vegetation, we talked about controlling vegetation through mechanical chemical and biological means. Of course, this would be chemical means. And we're not going to get into all the different chemicals and, and which chemical would you use for which plant. I think I gave you some handouts on that anyway. But if you're going to apply these to an aquatic ecosystem, you need an applicator's license. Okay, So you need to go and, and take the test and pass pass the test to get your license and when you're taking that though you'll learn about all the different chemicals and which ones are licensed for aquatic use and which ones aren't. There are a lot of chemicals that are that are identical but one has gone through the testing to prove it's safe for water and one hasn't and so technically you're supposed to use the one that's safe for water but a lot of times the ones even though the, the, the active molecule is identical um, I'm thinking of like Roundup and Rodeo. I think Rodeo has been licensed for the aqu aquatic use, um, but Roundup has not. But although the molecule is identical, there are other things in the Rodeo that help to get that molecule into the 
phytoplankton or whatever you're trying to kill. So it's not just that it's been tested for aquatics, but it also might have some other things that make it more effective. At any rate, to be legal, you need to have an applicator's license if you're going to use these in the water. Uh, all right, um, we've talked a little bit about oxytetracycline. We were talking about marking fish. This is technically an antibiotic. Um, I think it might be used in all kinds of livestock, like, like cattle and that. Uh, imagine that it would work as an antibiotic in fish as well, but it's mostly used, or it's specifically used, to mark the otoliths and the fin rays of fish. And it's more or less permanent mark, and if you mark the fish and then let them keep them for a couple of weeks, then mark them again, you can have double marks. Um, you'll recall that to see the mark, you have to remove the otolith or remove the fin, look at it under a special microscope and, and, and uh, hit it with a special wavelength of light and it'll fluoresce. But it is a very useful way to mark a lot of fish, especially small fish that are too small to take any other kind of mark. So this is a very effective and useful chemical. There's another chemical called calcium, which does a similar thing and it can be administered orally. So you could put it in their feed and administer the, uh, the mark that way if you want. A couple of options for you there. Other miscellaneous chemicals, we've talked a little about, about Aquashade. You're seeing this becoming more popular. It does seem to be effective. It absorbs photosynthetically active radiation, um, which limits photosynthesis. Uh, whether or not it limits the productivity of the algae, I'm not sure, but it does inhibit the sunlight from reaching the bottom, and so it stops a lot of your macrophytes from, from growing up. And it also sort of, if done properly, it can apply a, a pleasing shade, an aesthetic shade, to the pond. Of course, a lot of people overdo it. It looks like a toilet bowl. There are different companies doing different chemicals in different formulations now. So you, instead of having just the toilet bowl blue, you can have a more subtle bluish green. And um, It does seem to be effective and cheap and non-toxic and certainly is worth a try in a lot of situations. Copper sulfate probably should go back under uh, pesticides and herbicides. This is a way of controlling algae. Uh, you need to watch the turbidity, the pH, etc but it's a very effective way to control algae. It's very widely used. It seems to have low toxicity. It does, I think, build up in the sediments, and there can be some problem with copper toxicity in, say, drinking reservoirs over a long period of time. But this has been used for decades, and it seems to be a fairly benign chemical, excuse me, that is very effective at controlling algae. But as always, if you can avoid using chemicals, then if there are other other ways to treat say, the algae by reducing nutrients, that's going to be preferred. But it, we have to talk about where your philosophy lands. And a lot of times when you're doing fish management, you're doing a human-made body of water. You're managing a small pond or a reservoir. It's not a natural fish community. And so I personally don't feel as constrained to not use chemicals and things to manipulate it to get it the way you want. Um, but of course, it takes energy to make these chemicals and there's always the possibility of toxicity and sometimes in some of the chemicals, most of the stuff that I've given you here has all been tested and it's not very, it's not toxic at all. So you need to just kind of be familiar and think about where, where you feel along that continuum, how much chemical makes you comfortable to achieve your goals. Um, last chemical that I just added this slide, something I've come across called Foslock. It's a new product. It's a bentonite clay that's used to bind phosphorus and settle it to the bottom and kind of creates a cap of clay at the surface to keep this phosphorus from leaching out. It, anecdotally, seems to, to be very effective. I haven't seen a whole lot of studies over here. It's been used in Australia, Europe. China, those areas for quite some time, I believe. I think it's just starting to catch on over here in the States. Again, very benign. Uh, the, the product that they, this product is used in emergency rooms. If people have, I think, kidney failure and your phosphate levels of your blood get too high, they'll use the same chemical or very similar chemical 
to pull phosphorus out of your blood. So if they can use it for that, it's very benign chemical. I haven't worked with it yet, but I think it's promising for trying to lock up some of that phosphorus. About 160 pounds per acre is what they call a recovery dose. That means if you've got a pond that's got a ton of phosphorus and you're trying to reduce the level, it's about 160 pounds per acre, and then you have a, a lighter dose every year just to kind of stay on top of the excess phosphorus that's coming in. As always, reducing the phosphorus input and the nutrients would be a best long-term strategy. All right then, well, those are just some of the chemicals that we're going to work with. Of course, there are a lot more. Of course, there's a lot more details here, but I just tried to hit the high notes on some of these. So that's all I've got. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later.